So what we are doing, you, you may have seen some of the promotion on social media. We are going to be doing a two-part series on being certain about the Christian faith. And we're going to approach this from a little different perspective. Let me ask you this. Do you know anybody that maybe they're intellectual? They, they, they've heard your testimony. They've heard these things. But they want the facts of why the Christian faith is certain. They want to know why the Bible's true. Why should they really believe? They want the evidence. Well, there is evidence. This Bible that we hold is the infallible, inspired, inerrant Word of God. We believe that. Amen. And there's proof of why it is true. And we're going to go through some of that later. But we're also going to see some other evidence just in the gospel accounts themselves. So if you have your Bibles, Luke chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. We're going to read that in just a moment. But I want to tell you my attempt at a parable. So it's not going to be real good. But there are two people. Two Christians. They both love the Lord. They both want to serve Him. They both want to share their faith. They both want others to know about the Lord. One of them is confident and certain when they share their faith. And the other one is, is zealous and passionate for sharing their faith, but they just always second-guess themselves. Well, I believe this, but I don't really know how to, to prove it. I don't really know to show you where it is. Now, let me ask you this. Which one of those do you think is educated? And it's probably not what you think. Luke 1, 1 through 4. Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things that have been accomplished among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word have delivered them to us, it seemed good to me also, having followed all things closely for some time past, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, that you may have certainty concerning the things that you have been taught. And a little parable I told you, the person that was always second-guessing themselves was the person that was educated. When studies are done, it's actually proven the more educated we become, the less certain we tend to be about things like religion. The more open-minded, the more tolerant we are, the, the less we tend to look for evidence and proof. But it doesn't have to be that way. Now, I would be lying if I stood here today and told you I've never had questions about my Christian faith. I did have questions. And I'm going to share a, a chronology later on of what happened in my story. But I want to show you the facts. Because stories can be fabricated, experiences can be false, but the Word of God is sure, and it will stand the test of any scrutiny that we throw at it. If you will join me, I just want to open up in prayer. Father, I ask two things from the Psalms today as I begin to, to open my mouth. Father, I pray Psalm 19.14. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing to you, my rock and my redeemer. And Father, I, I also ask Psalm 71, 17 through 18. God, from my youth you have taught me, and still I proclaim your wondrous deeds. So even to old age and gray hairs, do not forsake me, O Lord, until I proclaim your greatness to another generation and your power to those to come. In Jesus' name, I ask you to bless your word today. Amen. Amen. So when you think about your Christian faith, has it ever been tested? Have you ever wondered? For many, it's when they're in college. I know it was for me. I wrote a book about that. My faith was tested in college. You come up face to face with all these ideas, with all these different truths. It's been tested in seminary too. All these different theologies and philosophies we spend time studying, not scripture. But my confidence continues to grow that scripture alone is all that we need. And the reason why is because the evidence is all over the place. We've been talking a lot about being disciples. You've heard Kenny talk a lot about that since the Great Commission Conference. And the thing about disciples is that they're, they're more than just being a fan. Sometimes we, we spiritualize this word in, in church. But if I tell you that I am a disciple of Gandhi or a disciple of Hitler, you would know what that means, don't you? 
That means I believe what they believe. I seek to live my life, follow their teachings. Well, if we're truly going to be a disciple, we have to follow Christ. And as we're going to see next week, the disciples started following Christ. But it was about four years until they had certainty about their faith. And so we can begin following Christ. Maybe that's where you are today. Luke writes his gospel, it's pretty neat, to a guy, Theophilus, a Greek. And he says, I've written this to you so that you can have certainty concerning, not things you've never heard, concerning things you have been taught. Things you already knew, but he wasn't necessarily certain about them. My prayer and my focus in this is that we live in a great day of education. We live in a great day of a lot of resources around us. But what we're lacking in our churches, and my mic just got away from me, is we're lacking conviction. Do we really see people that are bold and have the conviction of generations before us? Maybe we have the multimedia, maybe we have the the church buildings and all those things, technology today. But do we have that conviction and that confidence that they had? And if not, why? Luke 6.40 tells us this. A disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone when he is fully trained will be like his teacher. If we're truly disciples of Christ, then we're, we're learning something. And after we've been fully trained, after we've apprenticed, that word disciple kind of means apprentice then we're going to become like our teacher. Was Jesus confident about what he taught? Was he? He was. The Gospel of Luke is an amazing gospel, written to a culture similar to ours. And in that gospel, I only know this because I'm not that smart, but I've been preaching through it since early this spring. So in Luke, we see that when Jesus begins preaching, All the people are astonished at at one major factor about how he's teaching. They say, you teach as one that has authority. You have have certainty. You're not like the rabbis. You're not like these guys who lectured and they read dusty books and they kind of read the commentary from the pulpit on the Sabbath. Jesus wasn't like that. He had authority. He also casted out demons. He taught as if he knew what he was talking about. If we're disciples that are fully trained... Will we not have confidence? Yes, we're not Jesus, but will we not have confidence like our Lord has? We have the same Holy Spirit that he was anointed with, so we can have the same confidence. Scott, I'm going to jump ahead a little bit. If you'll go straight to that video. Um, This comes from a film. Some of you may have seen it, God's Not Dead 2. Let's watch this this one-minute clip. Did you apply this skill set any time outside of your official capacity? Yes, I applied my expertise to the death of Jesus at the hands of the Romans. And I actually looked at the Gospels as I would any other set of forensic statements. Within a matter of months, I determined that the four Gospels, written from different perspectives, contained the eyewitness accounts about the life, ministry, death, and resurrection of Jesus. And did you consider that the four accounts might be part of a conspiracy? designed to promote belief in the pledging of faith. Yeah, you have to consider conspiracies when assessing a witness accounts. But successful conspiracies typically involve the fewest number of people. It's a lot easier for two people to lie and keep a secret than it is for a twenty. And that's really the problem with the conspiracy theory related to the apostles in the first century. There are just far too many of them trying to hold this conspiracy for far too long a period of time. And far worse, they're experiencing pressure like no other unimaginable pressure. Every one of these folks was tortured and died what they claimed to see, and none of them ever recanted their story. So the idea that um, this is a conspiracy in the first century is just really unreasonable. Our Christian faith is reasonable. Sometimes we, we talk with people and we say, well, you just need to have faith. Sometimes the hardest people to share our faith with are people who want evidence. We may call them intellectuals. And we tend to say, well, here's my story. You you just got to believe. And we tell them our testimony. We tell them the gospel story. And 
it got away from me again. And they say, but I want evidence and I want proof. Well, the Bible does have proof. It's there. And we're going to see some of this in the Gospels. But we don't have to tell people to simply have fideism. That's kind of a big word, but fideism is this belief that's gotten big in America that is, our Christian faith is just about believing stories or fairy tales. It's just about having faith in something you have to disengage your brain and just believe, and that's completely false. You may never have had an experience, you may, may never have felt like you need to come and believe the gospel. Well, let me be the first to tell you today, you don't have to feel anything. <coughs> You can look at the evidence and you can know from the evidence this is true and you can have faith. Our faith is in an invisible God that we cannot see. But the evidence is clearly seen all around us. Kind of like the wind. We may not see the wind, we may not even always feel the wind, but we can certainly see the effects of the wind in the trees, on the grass. It's all around us. Now you saw that man's clip and that's a real life guy. He was an atheist. And he goes around sharing similar things like this. You can go on YouTube and find him, like he shares on the movie. And really, he talks for about eight minutes, but I thought an eight-minute clip would put you to sleep, so I can't do that long. But he, he talks about the four Gospels. And he talks about the historical evidence, why he, an atheist, after months of study, came to believe in the Christian faith. Because of the overwhelming evidence he found. And next week, I'm going to show you some more names of atheists who have tried to prove the gospel wrong, and they have ended up being some of the greatest apologists we have today, defending the Christian faith. But if you go to slide one, Scott, let's talk about why we have four gospels in our Bible. We, we don't really have four gospels. There's, there's one gospel message, but we have four evangelists who share the gospel in writing so that people believe in Jesus and have everlasting life through him. And they're writing to particular audiences. Now if you go to the next slide, Scott, slide two. Um, the reason that we have multiple accounts actually proves that Christianity <coughs> is true. Because if you're going to make up a religion. And in school I've spent a lot of time, we've, we've studied different religions, how people make them up. If you're going to make it up, you, you have to have one version of the story. You study other religions. If you adapt the story slightly, you tell it from a different angle, you're automatically a heretic. Yet in Christianity, we have the gospel presented four different ways. And this actually proves that it's true. One of the reasons why that guy on the video, a homicide detective, believed that the gospel account is true is because there were too many elements that matched up from different people's stories. Now, why do the, the four Gospels, why are they not all identical? Well, they're written by four different people, and they're written to four different audiences. But a good example is a car accident, and you may not be able to see the pictures there, so you get to see my great artistic ability, which is very bad. Um, but if you have four people that see a car accident, the X is a car accident, and you have four different cars that see this accident. They all see it from a different perspective. One's at a stop sign, they see it head on. One's coming, one's a few cars back. They're all going to recount and tell the truth in a slightly different way. That's what the four gospel accounts do. If you go to that last slide, Scott, hopefully you can see this. Yeah, I guess that's bigger than it is back there. The first gospel account we have is from Matthew. Now that's written by Matthew himself, one of the twelve disciples. He is also known as Levi. He was a tax collector. You may know his story. He primarily writes to the Jewish people. He has tons of Old Testament prophecy. He shows Jesus fulfilling. He shows that Jesus is the Messiah. But then you get down to Mark. And Mark was not one of the twelve disciples. The interesting thing about the four accounts we have is that two were written by the twelve disciples and two were written by guys that were not of the twelve disciples. The second guy is Mark. Now in your Bible you probably know him as John Mark. In uh, Colossians 4.10 we find out that he is Barnabas' cousin. 
in 1 Peter 5.13, we find out that he was an associate of Peter. He was, he was like Peter's Timothy. He became kind of Peter's right-hand guy. And here's John Mark, who started out in his ministry. He started out with Paul. He started out with Barnabas. He went missionary journey with them. He got freaked out, and he left them. Later on, Barnabas, his uncle, or his cousin, rather, wants to take him back along. And Paul says, no, the great missionary duo, Paul and Barnabas, split up. Well, we find out that John Mark ended up going with Barnabas. And later on, he went with Peter. And it's believed that shortly after Peter was crucified, after he was martyred for his faith, Mark wrote this gospel as an account of what Peter had preached. And so we have John Mark writing this account. It's primarily to a Roman audience. This makes sense. It's fast-paced. The Roman people were the military power of the world. They loved a man on the mission. Jesus is always shown as the suffering servant heading towards the cross. He always is shown with that mission. And Mark writes his account to that audience. Then we get to John, the Apostle John, the beloved disciple, one of the twelve. He, interestingly, was the pastor at Ephesus after Paul and Timothy. And tradition tells us that he wrote his gospel account in Ephesus, in Asia. Now this makes sense because John's gospel, if you've ever read it, is different than the other three. It's completely different. He talks about relationship a lot. About being able to know the one true and living God. And the reason why he does is because he's talking to an Asian audience. People in the East, people in India, people in the Middle East think differently than we think. We're in the West. We tend to follow the Greeks and the Romans in our culture. We want evidence. We want facts. We want logic. In the East, they want experience. They want to know the one true living God. They're, they're very religious. In fact, in India, at one point in the year, they will go, millions of the Indian people, they will strip themselves naked and go into one of the dirtiest rivers in the world. And they're trying to get cleansing for their sins. They understand they have sin. They understand all those concepts that maybe we try harder to prove here on our side of the world. But what they long to know is that God actually cares about them. That he took on human flesh. That Jesus became the God-man. Dwelt among us. So that we could have everlasting life. And John makes it clear. In John 20. 30-31. That he wrote his gospel. Not including everything. That could be included. But including what he did. So that we may believe in Jesus. And have life in his name. And then we get to Luke. Luke was not the last gospel account written. John actually was, but it's at the, the bottom here because this is where we're going to focus the next two weeks. Luke explicitly tells us in verses 1 through 4 why he wrote his gospel. He clearly tells us. Luke was a doctor and a historian. He was an intellectual thinker. He was one of those smart guys that we have a hard time talking to. And yet, God used him to put together a gospel account for that type of person. He carefully researched, he consulted eyewitnesses, he provided an orderly, meaning a historical account. And he wrote all of these things so that we could know with certainty. He wrote to Theophilus, that's a Greek guy, he also wrote the book of Acts to him. And the Greeks were notorious for wanting proof. Paul talks over and over again. The, the Jews have rejected the gospel because they want miracles on demand to prove who God is. The Greeks reject God over and over again because it se sounds like foolishness. We live in a Greco-Roman culture. That's what America is. We study many of the things in our education system the Greeks studied. We think a lot like they thought. If you go back to Luke, chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. Let's kind of walk through this verse by verse. Let's tear these scriptures apart in a sense. See what they're saying. 
Luke 1, 1 through 4, verse 1. Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things that have been accomplished among us. So many people have tried to do this. They have undertaken the task of trying to compile a narrative. By compiling, that means you have to study sources. You have to put together evidence. You're not simply coming up with something yourself. He researched this painstakingly. He compiled it. And he compiled a narrative. He did not compile a biography. None of the Gospels is a biography. They, they all put together only cover about 50 days of Jesus' life. Their entire purpose is to show us the things that we need to know. The proofs of who Jesus Christ is. He writes this narrative of things that have been accomplished among us. Many of the eyewitnesses of Jesus Christ's resurrection were still living at the time Luke wrote this. If he would have made this up, it would not have become a popular book in the churches. It's not logical. People that want evidence, the evidence is right there. Verse 2. Just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word have delivered them to us. So what? He's not altering the message. He's delivering this narrative. He's compiling it, researching it, and delivering it just as those who have been eyewitnesses. The apostles, the ministers of the word who have delivered them to us. He's not coming up with something new. Verse 3. It seemed good to me also. I wonder if Luke knew he was writing scripture. But regardless, the Lord guided him. It seemed good to me also. Having followed all things closely for some time past. He didn't make this up on a whim. He'd been studying for a long, long time. To write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you can have certainty concerning the things you have been taught. Theophilus already knew something of the Christian faith, but did he have certainty? It was written so that he, so that we, so that the people that want the facts can have certainty concerning the things <coughs> we've been taught. That word certainty. The Greek word there means to know the exact tr truth and to have certainty because of seeing the proof. That's what that word means. How do we get certainty? Well, we get certainty by digging into God's word. When Jesus was tempted by Satan, Luke 4.4, 4, he answered Satan and said that man shall not live by bread alone. Now, over in Matthew 4.4, 4, Matthew includes the rest of that quote, because you see it's in quotation marks. Jesus is quoting Deuteronomy 8.3, which goes on to say that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Satan wants to attack our certainty. He wants us, when we are confronted with those opportunities of people who say, I want the facts, I want the evidence. He wants us to simply shy away and to say, well, there is no evidence or I don't know what to do. The evidence is there. You may not know it all, but send them to Luke. It was written so they can know with certainty. Satan wants us to not have an assurance, not have a certainty about our faith in Christ and the Bible. And why? Because a Christian who is confident... In what God has said. The evidence is there. We can know beyond the shadow of a doubt. That Christian will have conviction and boldness. And a confidence and certainty. Like we see in the early church. Like we see in Acts. The second part of Luke's account. We see this very clearly. This coming to a point of certainty. After being a Christian. In the life of Peter. Now I'm going to talk a lot more about him next week. But I want to just show you the beginning. Luke 5, 10, and 11. When Jesus called Luke, here is what happened. Uh, excuse me, when Jesus called Simon Peter. And Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid, for now on you will be catching men. Simon Peter was a fisherman. He's going to leave all that and become a fisher of men. Verse 11, and when they had brought their boats to land, they left everything and followed him. Now, the they there is, is Simon and his brother Andrew. But here's the interesting thing. They leave everything. 
They leave everything and they're not even certain for about another three, four years. They're not even certain. They, they give up their livelihood. They go follow this guy who said, I'm going to make you fishers of men. You don't have to be afraid. Wow. They had passion. They had excitement. They put all their trust in what they thought was happening. But they didn't have certainty yet. Maybe we've been like that. We know and we believe we're saved. But do we have certainty about the things we believed? I grew up my whole life in church and I'd be lying if I said there was not a point when I finally had to get to knowing for certain myself. Because I can know the story and I've pretty much always believed the story. But there comes that point when we have to know with certainty. Maybe you've been doubting. Maybe you are the intellectual person. Maybe your friend or your spouse believes the gospel, but you're, you're, you're struggling with doubt. You don't really want to tell anybody. You're embarrassed. You don't really want to be transparent with having questions. It's okay to have questions, but take them to God's word. Study it out and find the answers. No matter what you throw at it, no matter what scrutiny you put the Bible through, you can't prove it wrong. You cannot prove it wrong. We're going to see Peter next week in one of his first sermons, say in Acts 2.36, this same message we're talking about today. He preaches his first sermon. Let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him, that is Christ, both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you have crucified. He wasn't confident for a while, but he sure did become confident. He ended up being crucified upside down, crucifixion tells us. He, he was crucified upside down by request. Because he said, I am not worthy to be crucified right side up like Jesus my Lord is. He gave it all. He was certain. The twelve apostles were certain. Thousands of Christians through the ages are certain. And more Christians die in our century now than have died in all the 2,000 years since Jesus died. You may not know that, but more Christians have died in the last century than have died in all 2,000 years combined. And they are certain. They are certain. You go over in India, you go over in the Middle East, they're certain of what they believe. If we have doubts, we need to settle them. We need to find the answers. So do you know what you believe? Maybe you have an atheist friend. Maybe you're an atheist yourself. They deny the Bible. Well, the Bible can't be true. It's just a dusty old book. It, you know, It's just all these religious writings. How on earth could it be true? Well... Number one, you're not really looking at any evidence. You're just assuming that. I can tell by your argument. If you look at the evidence, how is it that we have 20,000 manuscripts of Scripture? And I'll show you how many manuscripts we have. I, I pulled some numbers offline of other stuff that we consider authoritative and accurate. We have over 20,000 manuscripts of Scripture. And most of them are within a century of when they were first written. Now that's very close. You're going to see with some of these, one of them, the earliest manuscript we have is 1,200 years of a secular book, and yet we still consider it accurate. Not only that, for those who want to say, well, there's too many errors in the manuscripts, there are absolutely no errors in the book of Philippians. There's no spelling errors. There's no punctuation errors. Every single manuscript is exactly the same. And so even if you want to toss out the rest of the Bible... The entire gospel is perfectly preserved and perfectly <coughs> contained in the book of Philippians. Go read chapter 2. We see the incarnation of Jesus Christ. The evidence is there. The Iliad, maybe you read that in high school. The Iliad, the Odyssey, that Cyclops and all that stuff. Homer. The earliest copy that we have of this book that we still read and consider a classic fairy tale in school. The earliest copy is 500 years after we believe it was written. 500 years after. And we only have 642 copies of it. Then there's Pliny. He's an ancient historian that many scholars respect. Well, his earliest manuscript is 750 years after he wrote it. And we only have seven Copies, seven manuscripts, and it's considered authoritative by the scholars today. Plato, philosopher, his earliest manuscripts we have are 1,200 years after he wrote them. And we only have seven or eight copies of that. 
Livy, another historian, wrote 350 years after his writing is the copies that we have, and there's only about 20 copies. Atheists and skeptics usually accept those sources, but they don't accept Scripture. There's far more evidence for Scripture. Plus, let me ask you this. How can you have a book written over 1,600 years, like the Bible was, and every single prophecy is accurate, many written thousands of years before they came to pass, never does one fail. All that's true. There is a unity in what is written, even though there's 40 different human authors that God used. How can that happen? If it wasn't supernaturally put together. It's not logical. You want logic? Fine. You can look at it logically. It is unreasonable to deny it. The evidence is overwhelming. And I'm just touching a fringe of all the evidence out there on this stuff. In my own life, I did struggle with the certainty of the Christian faith. To kind of give you a a chronology of my own life. Uh, When I was four, I prayed many times to receive Christ. I knew the truth, and I do believe I was saved then. I I knew the truth that Jesus was the only way to heaven. I knew I was going to hell without him. He was my only ticket. And the Bible tells us, whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And I called upon him at four. But it wasn't until 12 that I finally understood, wait, I can actually know God? I can actually have a relationship with him? See, there was a progression here. At 15, when God called me and and, and I began to preach and I saw people saved, I saw people discipled, all that happened, but I still had doubts. I still was not certain. I, I believed Jesus was true. I believed he was the only way. But I did not have a certainty for myself that I truly was saved. Maybe it was the theology I grew up with. I, I don't know. But I, I doubted until I was almost 21. Whether I was truly saved. Whether this Christian thing is something that I can preach to others, but, well, I'm certain it's true for others, but I'm not really certain it's true for me. It's not that I don't believe it. So I'm not certain that I've been faithful enough. I was depending too much on my own works. If Luke would come, and he's going to play just some instrumental music, you can have confidence. And it's a journey. Maybe you've been a Christian. Look, I've been a Christian many years. I believe God saved me at age four. Doesn't mean I didn't have doubts. Doesn't mean I didn't struggle with things. It took time. Yes, college was a hard time. Yes, seminary. Studying all the philosophy and crazy abstract theology rather than scripture itself has been hard. But you know where my certainty continues to grow? It's scripture alone. Because simply reading it It's not reasonable to deny it. All the evidence is there. We just looked at four verses primarily today. There'll be a lot more next week. But Luke 1, 1 through 4. Look at how much evidence was in just those four verses. Look at all the things that he had set out to prove. That he did prove. The eyewitnesses he had consulted. People that gave their lives. Hebrews 10, 35 tells us to not throw away our confidence because our confidence has a great reward. The Lord wants us, Jesus Christ, Hebrews chapter 12, the author and finisher of our faith, wants us to have confidence to the very end. And we can be confident. When we doubt, you want to build your faith, go here. When I was in college at 17 and my faith was attacked, where I found comfort, where I found strength was scripture. It was then the Lord led me. You know, I have that hour in between classes. I should be using that hour to read scripture. And so I read 15 chapters in between. Went through my Bible over the course of that semester. It gave me the confidence. It gave me the assurance to be the one person in my classes that was sharing the faith. Even if you're alone, this book is the place to get confidence. But you need to be a disciple. Don't just study it on your own. Jesus says... That wherever two or more are gathered together, in his name, he is there in the midst of them. By that definition, I've had church in McDonald's before. And it's true. We've had our Bibles open. We've had the workers. I remember one time we were there for a couple months. 
and we had the workers every week. You could tell every five minutes they were walking by us. They didn't need to keep going to the bathroom. They were listening to what we were saying. They were listening to God's word. But we have to do it together. Wherever two or more are gathered, he's in the midst of us. To have certainty of your Christian faith is not something to just try to figure out on your own. Maybe you are that logical person, that intellectual. Maybe your friends or your spouse or somebody you're afraid. You don't want them to know you're doubting. You're afraid to really ask questions when we gather together in Bible study because you're just afraid to show that you actually have questions. It's okay to ask questions. It's okay to listen. But we need to do it together. Where two or more are gathered in His name, He is in the midst of them. But there's no promise that if you try to do it all on your own, that He's in the midst of it. It tells us in James 5.16 that there's a certain type of freedom that only comes from our sin when we confess it to a brother or a sister. Somebody we can trust. I've seen that happen. I've seen God break bondages. I've seen people that have hidden things for years and not wanted it to get out in the open. Finally be able to share it with somebody and then it all broke. Maybe that's where you are today. Maybe it's something I didn't talk about. Maybe you're that Christian who, like we're going to see, Peter has fallen away from Christ. You've backslid or you've messed up at church, at work. You've ruined your testimony, you think. You think it's all over. There's no hope. There is hope. There is hope even for one like that. In this time of decision, as Luke is going to play for a few minutes, what is God leading you to do? What decisions do you have to make? Do you have certainty of your Christian faith? And and do you know somebody that doesn't have certainty? You can bring them next week for part two. It's recorded if you want to give them this. I'd be happy to give you notes or stuff and help you. They want evidence. It's all out there. And there's a ton of it. But as we close, do you have certainty? Do you have confidence? Do you have certainty of the proof, as we saw that word means in Luke? It's there. It's available. If you have questions, it's fine. But search for the answers. Don't just dismiss it. That's what Satan wants you to do. He wants you to just dismiss it. Well, I need to have faith, and so the facts really don't matter. I guess it's just not cut out for me. No, don't let him deceive you. Find the proof. It's there. So as we pray... May God continue to move.